welcome everyone. Um, I am Siham Sireen. I'm uh, the founder of Better Conversations. I'm an executive coach um, and I've been collaborating with uh, RecWorks. We hosted uh, in one of our uh, uh, social um, contribution uh, cohorts uh, for leaders who coach, which is an online course for leaders, teaching them coaching skills. Um, we have got, um, I'm currently leading a cohort of um, aspiring women CTOs um, through that, and we've probably uh, got two weeks left. It's always bittersweet when it comes to the end. It's a, a, uh, almost a four-month course. Um, so, um, that was uh, sponsored by uh, Novoda and RecWorks, um, and um, we we hope to run another cohort in the new year, similarly to invite uh, women um, from this uh, group, but also from um, just generally wider areas um, and industries to come along because we're trying to get uh, and support more women um, being ready to step into those senior roles in tech um, there aren't enough of you um, and I also have to say I feel a little bit intimidated titsy bit by um, your backgrounds the backgrounds of our speakers um, very impressive I'm going to introduce you all in a moment um, <clears throat> but I, I think this is a really uh, kind of hot topic it creates a lot of anxiety lost sleep um, and um, potentially risk to teams and our organisations because we find it hard to step in and have some difficult conversations and be in that space. And I think it's very fraught with um, high emotional charge uh, combined with not having, not feeling confident being in those conversations um, and thinking about them differently. So I'm really hoping that we can get into some of the, mm. some of the knots of this here. It's lovely. We've got lots of people joining us. Please um, say hi in the chat. Let us know where you are joining us from. Um, and if there's something in particular you're really interested in learning or picking up today um, from, our, um, from our guests. So I'll start with an introduction. So Sonal Ratan, and please forgive me if I'm mispronouncing names. I have a tricky one myself, so um, I do try. Um, so, Sonal, you're co-founder and CTO of X8. Am I saying that correct? You are indeed. Good. Um, you're in London and your company um, is, uh, you focus on cybersecurity. Um, you're an aggregator, I picked this up, uh, aggregator of privacy enhancing techniques. Um, and you have, uh, this has been a four and a half year thing that you set up, help set up. Um, and um, so it's going to be lovely to hear your, your previous background was UBS and HSBC. So it'd be really fascinating to understand, you know, what that maybe what some differences are from larger organizations to now with you um, building your own team. Um, so welcome. Um, and then we have Florence um, Geschwind. Am I saying that right? This is how um, English speakers usually say it. Um, there's no E between the G and the S, so it's like more like a ksh, but... So to educate me, how do we, how should it be said? Um, so kind of like the sound that you make when you say action, this like yeah. slight guttural good just before the sh sound, so then and then like, vend, like vending machine, so the W is like a B. Okay, so put it together for us. Ach, vend. Akshvend. Perfect, yes. Thank you. All right. <laughs> uh, fabulous, thank you. So you're CTO and also co-founder of Lixia. Um, you're based in London and you're a chemical raw materials manufacturing company. Um, you've been going for over five years um, and, um, and you, are, uh, you did your PhD at Imperial College. Um, you're starting to get the sense, folks, of, of the heavyweights we have <laughs> um, here, so really fascinating. Sarah, you're CTO at OxHealth, um, based in Oxfordshire, um, and uh, my understanding is that you're a global leader in vision-based patient monitoring and management, um, and this has been, a, I think, the, the organisation's been going for, what, seven and a half years? Um, 
Yeah, so the organisation, uh, we've been around this company for about 10 years now. I think it's 10 years okay. this summer. Um, I've been with the business for seven and a half years. Right. Okay, fantastic. Um, and then we have Fiona. Uh, Fiona, um, I've got you here as an experienced CTO and cloud architect, and I'm sure that's an undersell um, of your experience. You're based in Sunderland, and you're currently with 3T Transform. Um which is a, um, a learning technologies developer so training a lot I, I think I read on on the uh, on the about section about 350,000 um, energy sector personnel that's correct uh, right so no small order at all um, fantastic thank you all for um, for saying yes to being on the panel um, I thought we would um, uh, get into two parts of tough conversations. Um, one is, you know, let's all uh, agree on what a tough, tough conversation kind of looks like and feels like. Um, and then maybe we could get into some of the techniques that you've learned um, and, and we can share those with everyone um, as to what's worked well. War stories are also welcome to um, in all of that, right? Um, just checking in, we've got Sammy. Um, says hi Sean um you don't work in tech um but often have uh, challenging and difficult conversations in your leadership role so you're looking forward to hearing from everyone fantastic um and Sammy you shared you're joining from London you're a principal software engineer and I'm mostly here to understand what being a CTO looks like to try and figure out where to take my career next so uh, you're obviously absolutely in the right place um in terms of this group aspiring women CTOs um, and um, fantastic that we've got um, our panelists as great models for where you could take your career so do keep introducing yourself folks and let us know what you'd love to hear and if you have any questions um, for panelists as we go um, my first question is um, really how do you define a tough conversation what goes into that and I wonder, Fiona, if we could start with you. I guess for me, a tough, tough conversation is something, um, it, there's a certain feeling that I get before having it. And there's a certain, um, some things that I do to mentally prepare for it. Um, I, I guess the, the tough conversations for me are always about um, explaining those conversations where you're trying to to convey to somebody that they haven't met an expectation and yeah I, I think the majority of tough conversations are about that for me right okay so a misalignment on understanding of what's expected um yeah uh, and generally around performance but it could be right um behavior other things right okay cool thank you that's a good kickoff for us um Sonal how would you define a tough conversation what sort of sits in that space I've had so many different tough conversations so it, it and there's always the the standard one is going to be with people that you're managing that sort of performance but I've also had in my corporate career, really, I've had to have tough conversations. I've had to stand up for myself where you've had aggressive other senior members and how they address you as well. So that's, you know, you've, I've had it from both sides, uh, whether or not it's been performance related or whether it's been um, just generally I was asking for, I was working for the management office and just asking for things that were being requested by senior managers. That wasn't seen as a, as a good enough reason and had an aggressive conversation off the back of that. That So again, I, I agree with Fiona, it is, you do have that horrible feeling that you've got to have to do it. It, is, it isn't good. Don't really particularly like to have them, but it is a part of being in a senior role. You have to stand up for yourself and, it, you know, and the aggressive behavior is definitely not tolerated. And you, if you don't nip it in the bud to start with, it's going to keep happening and people are going to think it's okay to do it and i i'm strongly against that mm. uh, okay so that's another that's another perspective where you're faced with a very you, you've mentioned aggressive 
um, a few times where you obviously you are being challenged in some way and you're having to advocate for yourself and stand your ground. Um, and that's a tough place to be um, as well. Right? Um, what's that conversation look like? What does it need to look like? You also talked about sort of if, if you don't clarify that from, you know, where your position is or where your boundary is um, early on. Um, it can make things even harder later on in those sorts of environments, right? Same way I have to treat my kids, I try to do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> nip yeah. It <laughs> yeah, nip it in the bud. Brilliant. I love that. Cool. Um, Sarah, what would um, how would you define a tough conversation? I mean, I think for me, I, I really echo what Fiona and Sonal have said, that you know you're going into a tough conversation when you just have that feeling, you know, kind of that instinct of, I'm not looking forward to this. And for me, it tends to be that that giving kind of uh, feedback where somebody hasn't performed as expected, where perhaps you need to hold a boundary. I think some other ones I've had are, um, if there's, sometimes I, I find that there can be an unspoken topic that is perhaps causing some controversy, but everyone's avoiding having the conversation about the issue at hand. And for me, like bringing that forward can, can be quite a tough conversation, but often needs to be done and, and has to happen. And the final one that um, I don't think has been touched on yet, but I know that I've done once or twice, and I think women in particular often sort of evidence is not being great at is conversations where you're going to say actually I'm not sure I'm being paid appropriately you know those conversations about compensation um or you know making a request to seniors that can just feel like you're you're sort of pushing something a little bit I think those can be quite tough as well mm -hmm. if you need to have those yeah yeah certainly um justifying your value um, and making the ask um, in that space and yes you know people you know that a topic needs to be addressed and everyone's avoiding it because it, it's complex or complicated or you know it, it um, is touching a few raw nerves or means that actually something hasn't been addressed that needed to um, on many levels um, so yeah um, and there's generally a tendency, we do avoid tough conversations. That's a kind of, as you said, you know, you never look forward to it. You have that horrible feeling about having to have it. Um, and so our tendency is to avoid doing it. But I think that's, this is what we're here to kind of explore and, and get into because it has so many benefits for us when we do, uh, do face it um, and deal with it, nip it in the bud. Um, so, um, Florence, how would you define it? Tough conversations. Um, yeah, I think sort of, well, echoing a lot of things that have been said, um, I think in the widest sense, often it's a conversation where you're sort of having to um, bring some bad news in some form. So maybe that expectations weren't met or <clears throat> we recently had to make someone redundant. Um, so these are always conversations where like, you know, you're, you know, you're going to be delivering a message that is not going to evoke positive feelings on the other side. And, and you obviously you're human and you feel for them. You don't want to make other people feel bad. Um, and that can be, you know, very difficult and um, uncomfortable to, to have. Um, and then, yeah, the other um, aspect, which has now also been mentioned is, um, yeah, if you want, if you feel like you're, you know, either your boundaries are not being respected or you're, you're not getting paid enough, kind of like standing up for yourself and, and kind of having to make a point about um, your values, which in that sense are clearly not the same values as the person you're talking to. So having a conversation about like something like that might be okay for you, but it's not okay for me and having not feeling silly <laughs> in this process and, um, um, yeah, and sort of keeping a, keeping the conversation clear because um, at least personally, I find sometimes you end up then kind of derailing too much away from like the, the core and and that's so these conversations where you're, it's something that you're uncomfortable speaking about and you're and like avoiding it and easily derailing from it. Those are mm -hmm. and quite mm -hmm. difficult, challenging, yeah interesting word yeah derailing I, we're so emotionally charged aren't we in those situations whether we're defending ourselves or, or trying to get into or invite a conversation um that um 
that can feel it, it you can you can get distracted <laughs> um and lose your position or or feel like you're floundering and and you know not maintaining your position in in, in the conversation and the discussion um so well i think that speaks to maybe some of the techniques we might get into um in a little bit about how we can avoid or how we can prepare ourselves for um, conversation so we don't feel that derailment. Um, I'm just checking in here with folks who've joined us. Um, Livia is joining from Paris, uh, alumni of Imperial. Um, I was wondering how you manage to keep going in these conversations when they make you think you're wrong. I think to your point, Florence, and feel quite lonely into, def into defending your position. We're going to come to that um, in a little bit. I just want to uh, go through everyone else. Esther from Paris, CEO of a startup. I want to manage well difficult conversations, especially for negotiations. Uh, and that for sure is another area of, of tough conversations. Um, Carla, uh, long background as a senior principal consultant at Oracle, uh, worked on an MBA there. Uh, emigrated to the Netherlands, rebooting your career. Culture is challenging and there are many difficult conversations you've had to have uh, with how men behave there or oh, here. Um, deeply ingrained sexism bias, good old boy network. I think that's something any one of us who've worked in a in a um, certain sectors will have felt, certainly manufacturing, financial sector and so on, uh, and also generally in tech, right? Um, <clears throat> um, and she says, uh, I think she was saying yes to something uh, said recently because um, she uh, doesn't feel so alone now in terms of having the conversations, um, but the challenge remains. So while she is um, part of an organisation, uh, it's nice to be part of something, right? Um, okay, so... Things that make some conversations really tough. Um, we've touched on so many, you know, performance, um, defending your position, making an ask, raising a hot topic. Um, what do you think is going on for people that can make conversations even tougher? Um, and uh, Sonal, if I could start with you. Oh, so, well, there's a couple of like, T tough conversations. Uh, uh, I, I think I was on the receiving end of somebody giving that that that. Um, the, the background was that I, I think that I was taking software. That so I, I was being. Is, that's what my field is. Mm -hmm. and it was being taken away from somebody else, and uh, the conversation was around uh, what have you done that. You, that you deserve to, to basically be in that position where you've got that and that was a really awkward conversation for me because it was an it, it was another woman actually doing doing this in reverse and accused me of all sorts of horrible things that in a professional environment when you know I'm married I've got kids but it went down that sort of level that was a really tough conversation but again mm. you've got to hold your ground because you know it's, you know, it doesn't matter. You you don't you don't know when that's gonna when that attack's gonna happen, but as you get into more and more senior roles, you gotta yeah you know, you're gonna have a lot of knives right in your back, right? You're gonna have a lot of these things, and you're gonna have a lot of difficult conversations. May yeah. not be the same one, but you know where what I thought was going on in my mind was purely out of like frustration and jealousy that it be, ended up being that you I, I was progressing and doing a little bit better. And the other person wasn't, and they were they they were on the the, the other side of that that so that no. that was a not a particularly fun one, uh, but yeah, but to have to defend your position to say yeah I'm actually um yeah funnily enough I might be a little bit smart and I might actually know what I'm doing and I might actually have like the skills to do what I'm doing as well that didn't factor into the conversation so I, I just a reminder right. of actually you don't have to be that person to be able to do that so that was um one of the eye openers um again management so when i told somebody when i had to tell my management that i was pregnant that was a really particularly tough one and that and now you can see what the, the reverse is that 
they're going to think, oh man, I'm going to have to pay for this now. I'm not going to get my project deliveries done. All of the, you, you can see it, but it's against the law to do it, right? So it's, again, you know, you've got to be able to you know, still be able to promote, still be able to give those opportunities if you are in that position. They are just different types of tough conversations, but you, you, if you're trying to understand it from the other person's point of view, it's, it's still, it's, it's not ideal. No. And what I heard there is, you know, a, a fear being a sort of common thing in there. So for the person that you took over the, um, the software from, um, it, to me, that sort of speaks to a culture of high competition and, um, a, and lack of opportunity, potentially, um, especially, I think, um, as a woman, sometimes you feel like you're fighting your corner a great deal um, and you have to protect your, your turf. And um, so I just wondered, do, you, do, those, do those things kind of feel like they ring, ring true for, for that situation? This uh, to you, to you, so not, yeah, just in what you experienced in that situation. Um, you know, what? it's it, it's it, you, you always try and put yourself in someone else's shoes and trying to understand it, but I, I don't think it was that it was lack of opportunities or any of those sort of things. Uh, in tech, to, to be fair, most of my experiences have been so positive. This is just because we're talking about the tough conversation, yes. I've had very, yeah, yeah, not had to have many. I've had like uh, amazing experiences. I've had some amazing colleagues. Uh, with the, the men that I've worked with have been super welcoming and love the fact that another uh, female is joining the team. So uh, like ju just to, to balance that part, point out, yeah, so, yeah. I've had more, but it's generally been collaborative. It's only in, in like small isolated incidences that I found right. that these things happen. Generally, from a tech side, I don't see it being hugely competitive between teams. It, it is more about the collaboration on that side. Okay. Uh, it's okay. when businesses, uh, business people are involved, etc. where that culture may exist, but I, I it, it wasn't well, that's great. normal. Well, that's, that's great to hear and very heartening. And I think a lot of people will be glad to hear that. So thank you for putting that other um, perspective in there. And so it was an isolated, incident um a surprise to it um but i think the other one that you mentioned as well about having to have a tough conversation around being pregnant and and what you know what did that look like for the coming months i think that's a lot uh something that i think a lot of women may have either gone through um or are anticipating for those who maybe want to see children in their future right um and and nervousness around having that conversation um, I want to uh, bring in um, other folks to this. Um, so is your perspective similar to Sonal's? Um, what would you add in terms of things that um, can make uh, a difficult conversation additionally tough? So I'm trying to tease out, you know, what are the uh, specific things that you think um, are relevant to, that can make those conversations even harder? Um, so Florence. Um, for, for me, the most challenging conversations have been sort of with um, my co-founders and they were always either conversations where um, there were emotions behind it, but they, those weren't clearly communicated or, or they weren't ad admitted. So on the one hand side, you're trying to have like a sort of like semi professional um, discussion and on the other hand side everyone is has um, emotions they're not openly communicating and it, it's it has at times made it extremely difficult to get to solutions that were acceptable because we were not really clear with I guess maybe we weren't also willing to admit to ourselves that this is how we were feeling and that this was what was guiding us but yeah if you have conversations where like even though maybe logically the outcome would be accessible um there's these barriers that aren't spoken about so um and it can be very daunting to kind of like Speak, break the taboo and do and, and speak about it and put it into the open um on the other hand side I've had sort of like not not super tough conversations but like 
conversations were like a lot of like unpleasant things were said, but because the outcome was sort of like mutually agreed agreeable, it wasn't as bad. So it was more of like a so I think the if the outcome is something that you know we can't agree on um and there's emotions that is that makes it extremely difficult because sometimes we both know what needs to happen and maybe we disagree over whose fault it was but um you kind of you you know maybe you, you throw accusations around for an hour but then after that <laughs> kind of done because it doesn't matter anymore um i yeah. think the the really tough conversations have been the ones that kind of like drag on because um we might agree on something, but then, you know, two weeks later, one person comes back and says, no, actually, I can't live with that. And then you kind of, you, you know, you ruminate <laughs> over it over and over. Right. And like, um, at some point, I think um, in these conversations, you can also re reach a stage where you don't actually know anymore. And you might actually, at some point, it turned out someone actually really misremembered certain things. And that actually made a huge difference because they were like, but you said that, that then. And I was like, it wasn't actually the case. So that kind of completely changed the scene. And it's very difficult to sort of admit that we're guided by a lot of emotion and it's not super rational. And, um, and even though we can maybe see how this is the best, it doesn't feel right to us. And um, yeah, and if that, is not, if that isn't acknowledged, that is very difficult. I think sometimes so, it's all about just acknowledging it because that can make someone feel much better about it. Um, right, right. Yeah. Well, and that's an interesting point. Uh, acknowledgement is just that acknowledgement. We don't always have to agree with their position on something, right? But the acknowledgement is a really important part of being able to move forward and get beyond. And even if you continue to have Dis, you know differing points of view but so yes yeah, so, some really interesting things there so the emotions of, of actually and, and having uh the feeling that you can voice um what it is that you're feeling our memories can trick us sometimes um and our perspective the, the sort of collection of data that we have may give us a certain perspective or point of view that uh, may and that may may be missing some information right which means we can't we can't see the logic of maybe what someone else yeah. is saying um, to move forward with. And and if I can just add, I think sometimes also the mistake of thinking that the data you have is also the data that everyone else has. And yeah, sometimes like hours into a conversation, you realize that one of the main reasons you're you might be advocating for one thing is because you know something that they don't know. And if and it's not that you omitted it you, they might it's something you thought they knew as well but then turns out they don't and maybe their perspective would be a completely different one so you can sometimes end up with a sort of like a deadlock until you realize that maybe <laughs> they don't know that <laughs> and then yeah. suddenly yeah. things move again but um and I, I for example I, I get frustrated really easily and I, I know that but like I I then I think Sometimes I'm like, but well, why don't you see it the way I see it? <laughs> yeah, right. and it doesn't usually right. lead to very good outcomes. So um, it's like, yeah, asking what, yeah, why don't they see it the way I see it? And then, right, right, yeah. right. And and as you were saying that, you know, some people don't have the data that I have. Everyone was nodding, so uh, I think that's a that's a common theme, right? We don't we have different sets of data, and I think a lot of the skill of getting in there is is um, trying to hold back and and be more curious in the situation, ask questions to determine what is the missing information, right? Um, so um, wow, we've got people joining from all over. Thank you, Florence. Um, we've got um, Kate from Poland um great um and i might yeah carla says i might know something they don't and they might not have told me something that's the other thing right i yeah. I, I certainly experienced that um uh, many times and it always surprises me with my own kids even i'm like this is what you need to say and then they go and say something that is far simpler and they don't understand why i'm being <laughs> <laughs> so specific about what it is that you say but I think it is so important that we're clear about um, what it is we're saying and why and what the impact of that is um, Fiona 
So I've, I've, I wrote down a few things while everybody was speaking, and one of the things I've written and underlined lots is mif missing information. And that goes <clears throat> that goes for conversations both ways. So more more amongst your peers or, or people that you're leading, it's it's you never know what somebody else has got going on professionally or personally. And then up over, I think people are less. Um, a lesson in about their their personal life and you know you you're not party to the whole strategy of what things what, what where where the business is going and um i guess is is and i don't think this is because i i have reached um senior leadership levels i i think this is a i've progressed and grown through life i've i have become more rational and i think one of the realizations I had was the more rational and the more I stepped out emotionally of conversations, the, the better I became at, at, uh, at understanding people and being more empathetic, um, which it's, it, I, that was something, it, it's a no brainer really, isn't it? But that was something that took me a long time to realize. Um, yeah, you, you, you never know what other people have got going on. Um, and and people generally behave and you, you can you can almost predict that certain people will behave in certain ways. And some ways I find more difficult to deal with than others. So I prefer if people boom, big, big explosion and then everything will be said and then you can set the the line in the sand again and move forward it's the people that are quiet and don't respond and don't give you anything and you don't know what they're thinking and you don't know what they're feeling and you don't know what impact you're having on them professionally and personally that I just I st I really struggle with that the the lack of feedback um both up over and down over in conversations yeah it's interesting and that echoes a little bit what florence was saying was someone might agree in the moment and move forward but then that's not really they, they feel uncomfortable about that position that they've taken and you know uh it can it if it's not properly resolved it'll come back up again right it'll bubble back up in in back in that situation or in another uh scenario yeah I, I've I've actually found that taking a break and coming back um, it, it, normally at least a week later works for for me. And it, yeah, yeah. Well, and that's an important. Also, I think someone mentioned you know negotiations. Taking breaks is one of the things that you you know that that the top negotiators in the world do is is make sure that they take a break before you know throughout the negotiations when things get heated and you know at the final sort of before signing anything um i think that's healthy for everyone because we process stuff at different rates and we sit need to sit with something sometimes um for a period of time before we are less resistant to an idea or, or a possibility right and um, so um interesting that you say that you like you, you like it you know you're comfortable with the you know the explosion or the explosive sort of expression because that gets everything out um in the open and then you know what you're dealing with yeah and i, I would say <laughs> actually when i'm when i'm on the receiving end of a different co difficult conversation i'm probably the exact opposite to the person i want to, i want to be in those conversations with so i i, I could I, I i know i withdraw yeah interesting isn't it and that's a natural <laughs> i think that's a natural su survival protective thing yeah. that we do right and in in those situations sarah so i think there's um fiona raised a really interesting point about not knowing somebody's personal context i also think that you get another challenge if you know somebody's personal context you know that they're going through an awful time in their personal life but you need to deliver them some bad news or you need to say to them, I understand life at home is hard, but actually you're not performing in the way that we need you to. 
it can I find it can make that conversation a lot harder to deliver because you feel like you're just sort of adding to to the challenges that they're facing um and that for me can be particularly difficult at times the other thing that I was thinking as we were talking is as well sometimes if I'm having a tough conversation with somebody I worry a lot about the impact of you know the conversation might be something quite specific about a specific incident that's occurred or or a specific problem but then I worry about if I you know upset that person or I anger them what's the fallout across you know the broader things that I need from them how does that impact other areas where I need their support or I need them to do some tasks am I going to kind of damage my relationship with them will they then not actually be responsive to the things that I need um and trying to work out a path through where you don't end up in that situation feels like at times for me it adds more pressure to those conversations. Right, so there's an impact personally on the relationship and the quality of the relationship, but what's the fallout beyond that? And that requires probably some strategic thinking about, mm. uh, you know, about managing so many stakeholders. Um, in that space right and what what um what may be at risk in the future by this relationship being damaged in some way so that's yeah absolutely I think that that um awareness of the the uh you know it may be a one event but the repercussions can continue for a very long time um so definitely understanding that um Okay, I'm conscious of time, so I think it would be great to understand um, what would be, uh, we've heard a little bit about some, some of the things that might help in, in uh, you know, having that conversation. So, but what do you do? What are your sort of go-to techniques for a tough conversation that you've got to have? Um, and Fiona, I wonder if we could start with you. Um, I like to make a plan before beforehand of what, what I'm going to say, and and how am I going to set an expectation and actually deliver on that? I think the worst thing for me would be to to go into the tough con conversation and somebody comes out the other side and they actually have misunderstood um, where that goes. So I absolutely feel the need to, for, for me personally, to, to maybe script a bit of it rather than wing it. And I love winging things. That's, that's pretty a, a, a wing life. Um, yeah, it's not a superpower. I wish it was. <laughs> uh, but just ma making sure that that I've I've got the facts um but there's a fine line um between making the other person drown in the facts and um so having them but not necessarily using them unless unless it's necessary I guess I would only use the facts if somebody started to to def deflect or um, were massively in denial um, around things. So yeah, making a plan, um, writing down the outcomes that I want this person to absolutely know and take away with them. And that goes the same for salary conversations as well. So I, I've been, I've actually come out the other end of that now. So I'm, I, I think I must go into a salary conversation like a man. <laughs> I, I'm, if, if there is such a thing, um, but I, I, I don't, I don't worry about having those conversations now, and, um, yeah, and I make well, sure. Well, that's yeah. well. Um, I think seeing as seeing as it's come up, uh, and I'm sure it's something that a lot of people struggle with. Could you share a little bit about? What is your position when you're negotiating salary, like? How do you, um, how do you do them? Um, I, I know what I, I have a figure and a bit of a range. And so I would go in and ask for at the top 
of that range and expect to be negotiated down. And um, I, I'm going to say this 90% of the time, I know everybody's just went, okay, that seems fair. Um, and, and that goes the same for having, uh, applying for, for new roles. Um, yeah, it, having a thing. interesting? And, mm -hmm. ju and just saying it. And mm -hmm. uh, I used to be like, oh, uh, and it would take me about 20, 30 minutes to lead up to the actual figure, which I've always had in my head. And um, I, th I think then you, you maybe lost a bit of, Bit, bit of the bit of ground mm, mm. well it conveys the he that hesitancy and then yeah. the question land thing doesn't convey confidence does it um and and so is doubt in their minds never mind <laughs> what's playing in our own minds about that that's fascinating so you would go in and, and basically say i'm worth this this is my expectation but it also what's interesting is i think you hold in your mind that uh, a readiness you've got a range so that you know where your line is what your minimum is for for what yeah. you would accept right okay and i think that's important to understand it's a negotiation um it's not a final yeah it's not it's not going to be the end of they're not going to march you out the room and go nope that's it <laughs> right yeah interesting thank you um so no, what would be uh what are your favorite techniques for um getting into tough conversations uh one uh, like, can just pretend i'm a bit on the spectrum and just go straight faced in and just give it give it my best shot and just say what, whatever the fallout is but no uh majority of the time it, if it's a, a sensitive employee type conversation I, mm -hmm. I i do use yeah yeah I always have to check what can i say what can't i say what should I, so I, I yeah in some cases i've had to take legal help on that because mm -hmm. you don't want to fall foul of that you don't want to, and people as um as mentioned earlier you don't know what the other person is going through and if you do know especially if you do know what's going through what's what's happening there you still might have to have that that tough conversation and what you know how do you need to take take those in you know, is it a tribunal what, what what action needs to happen off the back of that so yeah you know, always like to be prepared exactly for, for those tough conversations you always always want to be in in the have the your, your best foot forward i am quite direct though i i think that you know working with men for so many so many years my uh my number one thing is that that's how they are as well just direct say what needs to be said as well as so instead of like beating around the bush or uh like trying to make it nice for somebody it's yeah this is a, a professional conversation that we're having it's a it needs to be direct and it needs to be uh, clear what you're trying to say so yeah definitely the case but there the other part of it is is always so some of the conversations we have to have which are technology related that not everyone understands what from a technology perspective what needs to happen and then again having to have that evidence somehow being able to have the right analogy to be able to explain something that's technical but make it real life those are the types of other things that you, you might have to uh, like sometimes have to be prepared for and uh obviously negotiations on the chat a fair amount as well so there's uh there there is no other way but prepping but uh the, my strategy around that if it is negotiation on like deals and stuff is it, then you need one, more than one person so, so one person will stand, try and stand their ground but you can always then escalate it to so in, in our case it would be to our CEO to say you know and they've got the overriding thing that they can overrule what you, you've said and you've both got that understanding mm -hmm. so those are the, the the types of things that are, you know in terms of prep and how I, you know, the things that I, I need to, to be able to have and make sure I've got my facts about me. That's uh, definitely, definitely something that I, I try to make sure that I have beforehand. But in some cases, you can't be, it's, they are impromptu as well. So you, you, either way, you, you're going to have to think on your feet too. Right, right. Well, a lot um, in there, so and also... Um, the, uh, the the facts are, are really important being direct as well i thought that was kind of interesting in that you know that surfaces different communication styles some some of us are direct and that's not necessarily a gender thing either mm -hmm. um and um but 
it does happen in that space, right? Um, so, so yeah, and and um, I think, and I, I can certainly relate to being um, perhaps softer in my approach, and, um, and and I'm not sure that serves me um, much good, really, um, on on many levels, right? Because I think there is a value of being direct, and there's a value of sticking to the facts, um, especially in a you know in certain conflict situations um the last thing you want to introduce is is a point of view that may actually trigger or escalate the problem um because that's not helpful to the individual they won't they'll have a different perspective so facts are always going to be your grounding thing right um yeah and fascinating i also like what you said about um in, in negotiation situations um there being two of you in the room um and, and that's an important negotiation technique as well it, even in generally in meetings people in the room should have a role to play um and and it's worth rehearsing especially in deal negotiations and so on negotiating um, uh, rehearsing the roles that people are going to play um in that and how you handle um what comes up in those conversations so fascinating thank you for sharing that um sarah i think um yeah having a plan knowing the outcome that you're aiming at one mm. of the things for me that um i think has been you know harder over the last couple of years is trying wherever possible to have those con conversations face to face and absolutely not doing it through sort of a slack or email or whatever I had one particular situation that blew up quite badly when I was very frustrated about something and I sent uh what would otherwise have been a tough conversation I sent a fairly firm email and um it didn't get the outcome I wanted I think would be the the short version of it I think one of the things for me is identifying when I've got that feeling of anticipation about conversation what are the risks what are the things that I want to try and mitigate when I'm going into the conversation um, that I'm worried about because that then helps me kind of build out my plan and work out how I'm going to get to the outcome and knowing the personality type and the way the likely responses of of the other person as well can, can be very helpful to think about right yeah so knowing knowing what the possible um, things that may get brought up right um, that might derail us for example or right to actually thinking about those and some of that requires us putting ourselves in the other person's shoes right um, to understand even if we don't like their position or, or agree with it um, it's it's it works to everyone's favor to be able to see the other side and and understand what their what their challenges may be with with what's happening um and, and i think that also allows us to maybe learn to explain and, and to sonal's point you know translate or or explain um or demonstrate or use some analogy that kind of helps bridge different communication styles um as well um certainly using as much of their language as possible is always really helpful um in that so thank you. Um, Florence, what are your techniques for tough conversations? Um, yeah, pretty much what's been mentioned. So um, one recent employee review, I asked a colleague to fit in because I knew that otherwise we were gonna, just because of the personality of the person I, I was doing the review with, I kind of knew that I needed someone who could um, maybe just get things back on track if we get stuck in details because the person, tended to like forget the bigger picture and zone in on like one specific thing and like fight on that and um to like yeah not risk um leaving the room completely exhausted from like you know just having to keep the conversation on track just bringing it a third person in not really not really in the sense of like ganging up on the on the employee just to yeah help keep the direction of the conversation um also in another instance um we kind of did it as a yeah two-person act just because um um we kind of wanted to make sure that the um sort of like gravity of the situation was appropriately communicated um which would maybe be a bit difficult also because um um you know i was in my late 20s and the person i was speaking to was in his 60s um a white man who probably never had to 
receive that kind of information from such a young woman. So um, kind of, you know, understanding the yeah preconceptions people have or situations they might be used to. Um, I also, yeah, I mean, um, writing out a script or key questions that you can get back to. Um, in some cases, um, we recently we kind of like that was for a negotiation. We like played it out where like my colleague was pretending to be um, a representative from the other company, and um, and she actually did a really good job because the guy is really frustrating and non-committal, <laughs> and they got really frustrated. Um, so yeah, kind of um, role playing. Um, something that was mentioned um, where like people were like, oh, you know, you feel um, feel lonely in in the um, or you're not sure if it's really um, them who are wrong. Maybe you start doubting yourself with these things. Um, I find it really important to just like talk to friends and family and other people in your network and actually, you know, not create an e echo chamber, but actually, you know, confirm that it's them and not you, and like know know that it is them and that behavior is inappropriate and not go into it um, maybe too quickly. So yeah. Um, and in, so in one instance, I also said um, that was in, when I was still employed at the university, but I said, if, if we can't clear this, I'm going to go to HR and then we'll be, you know, talking with an, an outsider in the room. So yeah, drawing in other resources and preparing yeah, and I think that's that's helpful. Just even if those individuals are not in the room with you when you're having that conversation, but to have a means of preparing yourself. We talked initially, didn't we, about that sort of uh, uncomfortable feeling that we get when we know we've got to have a, a difficult conversation, and we can we can allay some of that by the prep that everyone's kind of universally recommending, right? Prep facts. Um, and um and compassion right for what the other person may be going through um yeah. and making sure that we've kind of covered covered those bases uh, and differences right age differences too i mean that's a that's a that's another dimension of this um and you know look the the i'm, I'm gonna add a, a couple more things just um as thoughts here one is you know sometimes we need to expect we're expecting resistance um, from the other person because it may be a tough message for them to hear regardless of our position right it's a tough message for them to hear uh, and sometimes that's about just holding space for them to absorb the information that you've given them and and holding back from feeling like you have to keep justifying why um, you've brought this to their attention um, and simply um, one of the things we teach on the course of leaders who coach is just holding silent space and actually how powerful that can be for the other individual and and then the other thing is what comes out what someone expresses immediately and we and we can, i'm sure we can all relate to this when we've received bad news we have a, a reaction don't we uh, a reaction to what we've heard we disagree we don't like it it's not news we wanted to hear and so what we initially say may be just an expression of that uh emotion or that resistance and we so allowing time uh, allowing people some space to kind of process that and maybe they have to figure it out and talk it through in two or three cycles right before they uh before they have their own words to express themselves because that's part of the frustration and that's what we that's part of us planning for those conversations is so that we're clear in our minds um and then sometimes it's you know um look, we need to, we've got this issue, we really need to, it'd be great to get aligned on this and get past it. Do you think you could have, uh, give some thought to how we might do that so that you actually give people an opportunity to the point that I think you were saying, Fiona, about, you know, uh, taking a break. We, we need a little bit of distance sometimes to think about it and the opportunity to be able to think about it, position our intent, which is we want this to work better um and then and then both of you have a chance to prepare may well give you a better outcome you just need to wait for that chimp to calm down don't you <laughs> <laughs> yes yes 
it's hard. It's a hard space, right? Yes. Um, being in tough conversations or chat. I mean, you know, and we can lose sight of we're all trying to work towards the same thing. Um, and it's, uh, we become very defensive. So it, yeah, absolutely. We need to, we need to calm the chimp and give ourselves space too, right? Uh, it's okay to take our time in, towards a conversation. And sometimes, you know, we should also feel like we can, if, if we're confronted with something, we should feel like we can advocate for ourselves and step out and go, you know, let me have a think about that. Can we organize a time where we can talk about it? Cause I'd like to get my thoughts together nothing unreasonable about that right um for, for ourselves so um um wow well um we've got like three minutes left um fantastic uh uh advice here i hope that's been really helpful to everyone um the the, uh, the comments and everything are brilliant i'm gonna take a note of those and, and pass those on um Thank you all so much um, for being on the panel. Um, I'd love to um, just go quickly around with, you know, a final uh, sentence um, that you would like to share with everyone who's joined us today and anyone who's watching uh, the replay of this. So, um, Sarah. Yeah, I mean, it's been a great conversation for me. You know, it's those takeaways, making sure you've got a plan and you know your outcome and you're making the space and time to have a positive conversation, albeit a tough one. Yes, yes. Uh, worth worth investing in as part of your, you know, yourself and, and others. Yeah, brilliant. Florence? Um, maybe um, choose to have a few small difficult conversations to sort of also increase your comfort zone um, if you're really struggling I think that's something that's helped me so kind of in instead of avoiding the small conversations that you might be able to avoid have them and then maybe it's less daunting to have the bigger ones as well very wise advice so yes use them as learning opportunities right they're low risk safe safer environments to kind of practice some of those skills um, that we've talked about today. Lovely, thank you. Fiona? I guess for me it, it's always entering them with uh, an idea that we're not going to enjoy this but something positive is going to come out the other side and I'm going to be open to it. They, they almost always result in a positive outcome and it may not be an immediate one but they the can only be good come from having difficult conversations and handling them as uh, professional adults. Can I just quickly answer one of the questions that... Yes, you, yes, please do. So, yeah. um, somebody asked a question about, um, do you have to be com competitive and combative? Uh, Sammy, I do not have a competitive bone in my body at all whatsoever. And... Um, Although I don't shy away from people that are being competitive, that is not a, a thing that that I would label myself as. Um, I guess I just love technology and I love building workplaces for technologists and um, people hire me to do this. So, yes, you, 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 can, you can absolutely be a CTO without being those two things. I'm so glad you um, you called that. Um... And uh, I didn't see it in, in my haste to, uh, to uh, wrap things up, but um, great question and a, a lovely answer. Um, and uh, I think that's shared. Thank you. And um, Sonal, would you wrap us up? Yeah, uh, for, for me, I, it, you know, it's just always to remember that you are doing this for, for the positive outcome. You are doing it for your company. You sometimes have to do these things because you're paid to do them as well. So it is your it is a, a job. So it, it is always trying to detach that emotional side from that and, and, and just always know that you're, you're not doing this because you feel like doing it. It is because you actually need to do it as a part of your job it is your job to, to, to do these too so i, I wouldn't you know, think too uh, much about it you know, if you've got to have to have them it, just think of it as it, it is a part of your job and it, it is going to become a part of your job if it's later and 
I'm going to echo Fiona. I'm not competitive at all. I just don't have that in me either. So um, prior to being the, the CTO, because I've, I've set this company up, uh, you know, I, was, I had many senior leadership roles within organizations in IT, and I've not had to be. I've, I've, I've needed to know, be factual. I needed to know uh, and know my stuff. I need, yeah, I love technology, just like that, as, as Fiona said, and I, and I like making it in a good place for people to work. Those are the, the exact things that you're, you're trying to achieve. So you don't have to kick ass every two minutes, right? It is, you, you can actually uh, do it in a really, uh, uh, enjoy it while you're doing it. You can actually uh, just let your personality go through with that. I love that. I, I feel like I have to offer that also to um, Florence and Sarah to chime in on 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 that point because it wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be a whole conversation otherwise. Sarah, are you are you competitive, combative? Uh, no, I certainly don't think I'm combative. At times, I can be competitive, but not in a it's more in my personal life probably than the, than at work. I think for me, it's about knowing like that feeling of inner confidence that I know what I'm talking about and I'm comfortable talking about the technology that we're working that sort of thing that's that's I think what enables you to position yourself as being a leader within the technical side of the business is kind of trusting your judgment on those technical matters on those matters of leadership not necessarily forcing your views through nice thank you and Florence um I would probably describe myself as competitive. I, um, but I don't think in in necessarily in the sense of the workplace. I'm quite outspoken. I, um, I, I'm a bit impatient, <laughs> as I mentioned. So I think I do tend to um, easily take on the lead if there is no one else who takes it. I kind of often end up sort of like filling a void and I fill it sooner than other people <laughs> just because of lack of patience I would say um, and I think it is important for, for me personally it is sometimes important to like scale back and let other people speak um, and not um, speak too much and um, but yeah I don't think you have to be um, competitive certainly I'm not doing it to compete against anyone else um, I'm mainly I think my sort of like sense of competitiveness is trying to do the best I can and um, um, yeah and you know trying to be better than I was last week or you know improving myself in that sense not necessarily trying to prove other people wrong or um, yeah trying to make a point so I think um, as long as we use our sort of like competitiveness in a, in a good way I don't think it's it's anything bad and I don't think it's and equally I don't think it's necessary so yeah it's a balance isn't it it's certainly a balance in knowing when that is but uh look I think this has opened up a whole other conversation um which um we may well revisit so really appreciate it I, I just wanted to say uh, and and riff off what um what some of you have said already is really be yourself I think the mistake is to try and be someone you're not um but feel comfortable in in who you are and how you're showing up um and if you apply a lot of the uh, techniques that um um, our leaders here have, show, have shared um, you it'll stand you in good stead but um, um, I think to head down the track of trying to be something else or someone else um, can it can lead you down uh, a very wild and lost road um, so I, I echo what what's been said here today is really be yourself enjoy what you're doing um, and um, and back yourself uh, and figure out the ways that you can do that. So, wow, brilliant. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so there will be a, a recording that you can access um, and look out for the next uh, panel session for aspiring women CTOs. To our panelists, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed uh, the conversations. Fantastic, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good afternoon. Thanks everybody and panelists. Bye. Thank you. Take care.